Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if it's a if it's a decent, and sometimes people make stupid remarks on old videos. But anyway, engine performance two test five. Uh, let's just jump through these 29 questions as quick as we can. And uh, you guys pipe down over there. Inductive amp meters work because of what principle? C. C, a magnetic field surrounds any wire carrying a current. Also, if I roll up a piece of copper wire into a loop right here, and I hook a meter to it, to each end of that piece of copper wire, and I'm talking about this magnet wire that's actually got this shellac on it that keeps it from touching itself. It's kind of like the wire in these little relays. See that little magnet wire right there? Well, that magnet wire right there has got a little shellac on it, and it, it's, it looks like you just got a bunch of copper wire, but it's not bare copper wire. It's got some non-conductive stuff on it, and that causes the electrons to have to go around and around and around and they and make a really intense magnetic field. You put a steel core in that and that makes a really intense magnetic field in that core and it can move things and cause things to happen. But if I wrap some copper wire around and I run a magnet through it like this really fast, it's going to cause voltage to appear on my meter. You know. All right, so that's basically anytime you sweep a bunch of magnetism across copper windings, you're going to get some juice. A meter used to measure amps is called what? M meter. Mm. Right. Yeah. M meter. That's the D. That's the D. Uh, what is what's a coulomb? C O U L O M B. You ever heard of that before? Nope. If I remember my math right, that is a billion billion electrons. That's one coulomb. Right. Electrons are very tiny too. Uh, a voltmeter should be connected to the circuit being tested A in series, B in parallel, C only when no power is flowing, and D both A and C. In parallel. If it's going to be hooked in parallel, you know, negative to negative, positive to positive. That's what you call parallel, right? <laughs> Whenever I'm jumping a car off a jumper cable, am I hooking it up series or parallel? Series. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's get a series in parallel straight. Okay. Looking it up like that, right? Yeah. That's parallel. Oh, cool. If it was a battery, let's think this is two batteries right here, right? That's oh, parallel. Well. All right, now if I hooked it up in series, I would be doing this. Essentially bridging it. <laughs> okay. See what I'm saying? That's series. Series is basically whenever you're uh, hooking it up so that you've got two terminals that aren't being used. I may have drawn that screwed up on them. Hold on a minute. I'll get the concept. This is, this, is a bit, this is two batteries in series right here. Okay, plus, minus. Okay, plus, minus. Got that? We're going to hook these up, and then this right here is going to be our plus, and this right here is going to be our minus. Those batteries are in series. Oh. Got me? So you're having a post that you're not using that's plus and another one that's minus. These two are connected together. And whatever you hook up here, like if these are, if these are those 12 volt batteries, you're going to see 24 up there. Nice. Got me? One time this farmer came to see me way down there. And if I've been working on an engine that's really hard to spin because it's been setting up and the cylinder walls are dry, you know. Uh, if it was an old engine, he's had a 455 Oldsmobile or a 454 Chevrolet or something in his inter irrigation motor. And I went out there and tuned it up and all that kind of stuff. When we were spinning it over, we had a good strong battery on the truck and the battery on the motor was pretty strong. You have two strong batteries to do it, but he goes, he go, rah, 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 rah. We couldn't really get enough going to get it bust off, you know. And so basically, because it didn't have any electronics on it and it just had breaker points, you know, like him on the corner of the board and all, I hooked the battery, the, his pickup and the battery on that thing up in series, and it spun the starter really, really fast, and it fired right up. Yeah. Is that negative going to the positive? No, on a, on it a is. That's right. You got positive and negative hooked together, and then these are, these are your two terminals you're going to use. I'm saying, though, no, but do this, do this negative go to the positive? No, this is your load. This is your load up here, or your meter or whatever. And I can show you that in a shop of two batteries. What you're going to do is you put the battery side by side, hook the negative from one battery and the positive the other, and then your two posts that aren't being used, that becomes the new negative and positive post for your 
battery. But and it, battery. Yeah, and it doubles the voltage. But do you hook the negative to the positive side of the other battery? Yeah, that's that series hookup. And then you, no, not these two here now. I'm talking about to the load. Do you hook it or do you just hook it? No, you're just going to hook up a load like you would anything else. And you know, when you got negative and positive, I'm going to hook the, the load's going to have a couple of pins. Like if it's a motor or a starter or whatever, uh, just a, just forget about what's down here. Okay. And you got a couple of jumper cables going up there. The only difference is when you hold in your jumper cables, the voltage potential is 24 volts now because you got two batteries wired in series, okay, and that's going to. Understand gonna, that. Okay, yeah. but say for instance, that's a battery up there, which you call a load, right? That's another battery. Yeah. All right. So the negative cable is going to go where? To so the negative. If that's a, oh, you tell me if I had a battery up there. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, now, like I say, if you do this on a modern day car, you're going to destroy you all the electronics. You'll destroy electronics. But yeah, if you got a battery up here and it's, and it's minus and plus, uh -huh. you're going to go there. Okay. You know, just so like that. Minus yeah. and minus? Yeah, you remember that, huh? Well, see, that's what you No, excuse me. No, yeah, minus to minus on that one. Because you're basically using this to put 24 volts into that 12 volt battery. Yeah, which is, sounds kind of crazy. That might make an explosion, right? Well, it's not a good idea to do it, but basically whenever you've got loads on that battery that you're spinning over, like I used to, what I did on mine, you know, what I, what you do is you would take the battery cable off of like a, if it's an old diesel tractor or something you're trying to get started, right? Now don't do this on any car with electronics. You take the battery, the, the positive battery cable off. Got me? All right, now you're going to take your other, your battery cable, I mean your jumper cable from the other, I am. Uh, right now, I'm busy. Right now? Right now, I'm busy. Okay. I'm in the middle of something. You think maybe, do y'all have any belts here? Uh, we can buy some from the parts house. Okay. We don't have any free belts. No. No. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Anyway, so. Alright. So I've got my, I've got my battery over here on my vehicle. And I've got a positive post and a negative post, right? All right, now I've got my vehicle over here. I'm trying to start off. And I've got my positive post and my negative post, right? Okay, so I've got battery. I've got these jumper cables or this, these battery terminals are still going to the truck. You know, it's like they always work. Okay, now that I've got my, I've taken this one off. Right here, this is still connected. Got me? All right. All right, so I'm going to pay, I'm going to take the negative battery over here. You can't have the cars touching, and you hook that to here, right? And then you hook this to here. <laughs> you got me? But I mean, you got your while well, you got your other cable. You know, I mean, that's basically you're putting 24 volts into the car. Basically, is what you're going to do there. The uh, reason I don't reason I don't go into that or in a lot of detail. Is because somebody will think I'll just try this, and the next thing you know, you you know, they're pulling the car in, and it's got a bad instrument cluster, and it's got a bad engine controller, and it's got a bad module, it's got bad everything on it. You could do that back in the '60s, and even the early '70s, but you better not do it on anything that's. So why would that be necessary? Well, it's what I was talking about earlier. I mean, I was when I was about this earlier. If I go down to the irrigation pond, and this engine that we've just you know put plugs and points in, and the Walls come off the cylinder walls and it's just spinning real slow. In spite of the fact that you got good batteries, you want to double up on your voltage so that that thing will spin fast enough to get fired up. And I used to do that on shrimp boats when I'd work on shrimp boats or inboard outboards. Down there when I was working at Port Arthur, the guy, you know, that you'd spin it over and it's going and say, "Well, we need to, we need some speed on this so it'll fire up." You know, if everything else is right and that thing ain't spinning fast enough, it ain't gonna fire and run anyway. So if you get it spinning up, it'll bust off and go. See? What's the permanent solution for that? It'll actually, when the oil gets splattered around and the cylinder walls get wet, it'll spin at normal speed. Okay, so now I know you're talking you're about start. you're talking about one that's way old, you know, that hasn't had any, you know, doesn't have any oil or anything. Now you can also pull the plugs out and squirt some, you know, transmission fluid in there and do it that way, or oil or something, you know, whatever. Then or pull the spark plugs out and squirt some, because you're oil in the cylinder walls, man. You know, the rings dragging on the cylinder walls and the little things, you know, they just got to be oiled. They're all they're oiled when they're running all the time, but when that oil goes away because you've tried to crank it when gas is going in there, there's no spark or something like that, uh, on the ones with the high-tension piston rings you used to have, it drags, but on the newer tension, newer ones with low-tension piston rings, it'll sound like it ain't got no compression. It'll go, you know, 
because it's washed the cylinder walls down. It's different on different engines. It's not the same ever across the board. And uh, as much as you might like to say, if I learn this one principle, I can fix everything with it. You, everything's got to be tailored for that particular thing. You know, the, the physics is the same, though. Uh, but there's variables that are figured in. Okay, uh, caveats and all. So you're basically hooking your voltmeter up in parallel. An ohmmeter should be connected to the circuit being tested. Uh, that's number four. Only when no power is flowing. And I'll show you something that I ran into one time when I wasn't watching that. Engine block, right here. Body of the car, right here. Battery, right here. Okay, so the battery, the ground goes to the block. And then it obviously goes to the starter, which is a junction that feeds all this other kind of junk. There was a ground wire right here, a braided ground wire going over here to the body of the car. All right, I got my little meter and I hooked it up. And what are you talking about, Joe? All right, and I went right here and I went right there. I was trying to see if I had any kind of voltage drop, not voltage drop, but ohms. I'm sorry, I was talking not ohms. That was goofy. I had ohmmeter here, and I want to see if there was any ohms or resistance between here and here. Because I left the battery cable hooked up, in spite of the fact that I didn't think any current was flowing anywhere, my meter was reading all over the place. It was just reading, you know, 40, 50, 60 ohms and all this. Yeah, but when you took the battery cable off so there was no power anywhere, it read zero. So what I mean is, anytime you're measuring anything with an ohmmeter, if any kind of a battery cable or wire or whatever, an ohmmeter, you know, I've it used to be a big deal. I said, no, don't do this. You'll fry my meter. You know? Well, we're not worried about that as much as we are getting an accurate reading because these little meters we got right here don't cost much anyway, the ones we use around here. And, of course, you really want to be careful with your, you know, three, $400 fluke meter. You know, be careful about that. Anyway, the long and short of it is always unhook your battery when you're checking the ohms on any part of the car because if you don't, you're not going to get a right reading. You'll be fooled. You'll be confused. You'll try to fix stuff that's not broke if you do that. Take the battery cable off. Everybody got that. You got it. You got it, Braxton? You got it? All right. I'm going to send those guys to the dealer principal up there if they don't quit talking. All right, now then. A high impedance meter. What's the, what's the significance of a high impedance meter? What does it mean when something is high impedance? If I told you to bring me something to measure with that was high impedance, and you saw a test light, and you saw a meter of some kind, you're basically going to get me... Usually a digital ohmmeter is impedance. Okay. Tell me what that means. Okay. We're going to go as we can. How many of you guys have ever been checking uh, something like a relay like this right here? You know, that was in the in a circuit. And, you know, you got your coil, you got your common, you got your normally open, normally closed. All right. Now, you basically take your test light and you put it on ground and you go over here. And let's say this is one that the coil is powered up on. You can touch that relay with the tip of that test light and it's going to close that relay because the test light's carrying enough current because it's low it's high I mean it's low impedance it doesn't impede the current and so it's going to click the relay and turn it on when you didn't want to do that you know what I mean but if you take your meter is meters high impedance and it'll measure the voltage without turning on the circuit that's basically the long and short of it is so you want a high impedance meter when you're wanting to measure the voltage without changing anything a low impedance meter, I mean, or not a meter, but a test light is a low impedance. They also make high impedance test lights that when you can check it, it won't turn on any circuits because it's got a bulb that will shine but don't pull any current. So that's a high impedance, low impedance. So let's look again at number five. High impedance meter does what? Can measure a high voltage, measures high vo amount of uh, current flow, measures a high amount of resistance, and has a high internal resistance. Yeah, internal resistance is high. There, it's got it where not a lot of current can't flow through it. Number six, a meter is set to read DC volts in the four volt scale. Now let me tell you guys, every time you get a chance to read a meter, you need to read a meter. Now there's a lot of times I don't use a meter because I think that the, the meter is, a, is not a good thing to use whenever you're trying to measure a load carrying circuit because the meter is going to tell you there's 12 volts there but there may not be enough to pull a load. You got me? So you're a lot better off to use something that will pull a load when you're checking a load carrying, even a ground. If you think you got a bad ground, what's the best way to determine if you got a bad ground? You're going to put a load on that ground, see if you can carry it, like a headlight bulb or something. Hook a headlight bulb up to hot, hook it to the ground you're checking. If it'll burn that bulb, it's good. If it won't burn the bulb, then it may light up your little test light even, and it may turn on your meter and tell you you got 12 volts there. 
But if you check it with your meter, and I, yes, I got 12 volts, and you go off somewhere else, when you had a, tr a scratchy ground that wasn't strong enough to pull that load, you can get your fanny kicked and put parts on a vehicle you don't need. And all of the training that I go to at KC Vision and Max Convention and all these places, these electrical classes they teach, if you go to a lot of the colleges and stuff, they'll tell you, never use anything except a meter when you're working on this modern stuff or you'll burn something up, you know. I did work for 25 years with a test light, never burned up nothing. Got me? All right. Now then. All right. But the long and short of it is, uh, a meter, because of the fact that it's got high internal resistance, will tell you a lie when you need to know the truth. So if a meter is set to read DC volts on a 4-volt scale, the meter leads are connected to a 12-volt battery. What's it going to display? Well. Wait a minute. It's set to read on the 4-volt scale. Oh, you I thought you said 12. I'm sorry, uh, Lindy. You said you said OL, and I and I heard 12. That's what I heard. You said OL. It's out of limits, yeah. Um, what could happen if the meter leads were connected to the positive and negative terminals of the battery while the meter leads were set to read amps? Yeah, it, it'd mess up the meter. Uh, and if you've got one of these uh, fluke meters and you blow the fuse in that doggone thing, those fuses are running for about $10 a pop now. It doesn't take very many of those for it to uh, give you a little bit of a headache there. You can buy some lunch, uh, a nice lunch for what a fuse for one of those meters costs, uh, depending on where you eat. But anyway, um, so don't take an ohm meter. Let me see that meter. Is that meter over there? There's a meter over there. Don't put the doggone thing on amps with it hooked up to read amps and hook it across the battery. You got me? That's a bad idea. If you got it hooked up, if you got that thing set like that, if you got it set like that, see where I got it set on amps and I got that, those two leads like that? You're supposed to be letting the current flow through it on the way to your load, and it will read what the load's pulling. But if you hook it from positive to negative, the meter becomes the load, and then it's, you've either destroyed your circuit board or you're blowing your fuse. Now, these meters cost about $10 a pop, and that's one of the reasons that I've got $10 meters here instead of really expensive fluke meters and stuff. Secondly, nobody's going to steal these because you can buy one at the parts store for dirt money. Uh, and also, if the you know, fluke meters get run over and people steal them, and, and it's three or $400 a pop, and I don't have that kind of money in my budget. Okay, put that down. Um, so, the highest amount of resistance that can be read by the meter set to the 2K ohm scale is what? 2K ohms. 2K ohms is 2,000 ohms. If you, when I'm measuring a, a resistor or something, I like to start on the 200 ohm scale, and I like to connect it to both sides of the resistor, and a lot of times these meters here, if there's some continuity there, but it can't read it on that scale, it'll flash a number on the screen and it'll go away. Then you click it up to from the 200 to the 2000. And if it does that again, you keep going up. You want to get that reading on the lowest range that you can get it. Now, m most of them, a lot of the meters nowadays are auto-ranging. That's okay. Huh? Yeah, they're auto-ranging meters, but that's okay. But you better be paying attention to what the little letter is in the top right corner of the screen because you may be looking up and it may say 4.5 is that 4.5 ohms 450 ohms or 4500 ohms what's in the top right corner of the screen is going to make all the difference if it's a k if it's an m or if it's just an ohm symbol you know you got to watch that i mean a more expensive I could, the meter i carry in my pickup truck one i used when i was in the field is a 300 dollars tektronics meter i bought from the mac tool truck and it'll measure injector pulse width and all kinds of cool stuff uh, that's fine, but I'm the only one using it, you know. And it's got one of them doggone $10 fuses in it. And it'll measure, you know, I think 20 amps or something like that. But the long and short of it is, um, auto-ranging meters are okay, but they will get you in trouble. If you know what your read meter is set on, you know how to read it. If you, if you, and I have I've seen guys in the field have an auto-ranging meter, stick it on there, and they didn't know what the numbers they were reading meant. They didn't know what the reading was. Yes, it found the range, but you can set it... On well, most of these really good ones, you can set it where it won't auto-range. You can choose your range so you'll know what it's on. So it's not a bad idea to have an auto-ranging meter. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, the digital meter show, a face shows point, 0 0.93 when set to K ohms. And what does that mean? 930 ohms. Is that right, guys? Uh, what would be 1.0? That would be 1,000 ohms, wouldn't it? Got it? When it's set to 1,000 ohms, in other words, K ohms is 1,000 ohms. A reading of 432 shows on the face of a meter set to the millivolt scale. What does that reading mean? 
432. You're on the millivolt scale. You're seeing 432 on the meter. What does that reading mean? 0.432. Yeah, 0.432 is basically 0 0.4 is 432 millivolts. Got that? That's, four, that's a little less than half a volt, isn't it? All right, let's keep going while we got some momentum here. Which of these is safe for use in circuits with electronic components? A, LED light, B, continuity tester, C, both A and B, or D, neither A or B? I like an LED test light. Not bad for that. And I had a little LED test light I used to check delicate stuff. Now, it's pointless to use any kind of a test light when you're checking something like a throttle position sensor voltage. That's when I get my meter out because I want to know what that voltage is. I want to read it like the computer does. The computer is high impedance. It's not going to short that voltage away. It's basically going to read what's there uh, like, a, like your meter. So if you want to see what the computer's seeing, that's when you break out your meter. If you're just trying to see if something will pull a load, that's when you break out your test light. Which device illuminates a different color when connected to power or ground sides of a circuit? Logic we got probe. logic probes are cool. They're our friend. Uh, which device may be useful for testing Hall effect sensors? I despise this telephone. Hey, Tammy. Hey, Richard. Yeah. Um, on the faculty credentials, you sent me yours, but I'm unsure how to key in these initials. We have ASE, and you also have on there about the hybrid vehicle. Right. Do you know the abbreviations for that? Is well, that particular, that, that comes from ACDC, Automotive Career Development Center. That's what so ACDC stands for. do you for. think ACDC is yeah. what we need to put? Probably, unless you've got room for Automotive Career Development Center. Uh-uh. We don't have, it's just initials only. Just put ACDC. Just put ACDC. It'll work. ACDC. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Wow. Okay. The boss calls. i got to answer the phone. Sorry. 13. Which device may be useful for testing Hall effect sensors? Uh, 13. That's actually B, actually. A logic probe. When using a digital multimeter, the black lead usually goes into which port? Common. That's very good, Mr. Lundy. Uh, KHZ is a unit describing what property? What's a hertz? I mean, what is a hertz? No, what is what is one hertz? One time per second. That's it. That's a hertz. Yeah. Megahertz is when you get hurt really bad. Isn't it? No. <laughs> okay. But anyway, that's whenever uh, one hertz is one time per second. It's one. You know, it's a, you got to find out. I don't know what the standard is. If it's kilohertz, it's thousands of times a second. If it's megahertz, it's millions of times a second. That's like a difference on your radio between AM and FM, you know, and all that. So, ammeters should be connected. Uh, what with the circuit being tested? Come on, son. In series, bingo. All right, we're about halfway there. To prevent blowing the meter fuse in a digital multimeter, what are you going to do? Uh, both A and B. You're going to install a fuse in line with a meter lead. However, there is a fuse inside the meter. But if you put a fuse in a meter lead, it's a little weaker than the one inside the meter. You'll pop the one in your meter lead. It's a lot easier to change. It's less expensive. Basically, the way you do that. Uh, Chrysler has got some stuff in. I mean, these little wafer things that look like capacitors, sort of, in their uh, junction boxes. And those darn things, when you short them out, they just get to where they won't conduct anything. And then when they cool off, they go back to conducting just like they did. They're almost like an electronic circuit breaker with no moving parts. And when I was at Chrysler Electrical School one time years ago, he gave us one of those and had us to make ourselves a jumper wire with one of those in it. So if you shorted something out, the continuity would go away, but you didn't have to replace a fuse. You just unhook it, and then it would come back when it cooled off. Pretty cool stuff. The little tan-colored wafers, you'll see them in the junction box if they're concerned about having them, you know, popping fuses or something. Those things are cool. Um, i tell you one of the most annoying things to try to fix is somebody comes in here on their vehicle, and they say, about once every 10 days, my stoplights blow the fuse. Hate that kind of stuff. Because you can put a fuse in there and you can drive that thing around until you're, you know, crazy. And it's not going to blow the fuse. You give that thing back to them, they're going to come back the next day with the fuse blown. Now, what's serious about this? If the stoplight fuse is blown and all of a sudden their stoplights don't work no more, they're going to get hit in the back end. I mean, that's important. 
You know, it's, it's annoying, and you basically, and you, listen, let me tell you something, guys, while I'm thinking about it. Do not get the idea that I just want to get this out of my stall, and I don't really, and I get on to the next job, I don't really care if it, you know, about it. I'm sick of this job, it needs to just go away. That's when you mess you don't do your service customer, your customer serve good service that way. If they're driving in here and want you to fix something that they don't know how to fix, you need to give it everything you got. You know what I mean? You need to fix that doggone thing for them. And I tell you, the ones that will really get you in trouble, even in a court of law, if you come in and they say, I want you know, this and this and this looked at, and you give them an estimate, you say, okay, that'll be $2,200. And they say, okay, fix it. And you fix it, and they pay you every penny that you said to charge. And then, you know, if something happens that blows up in their face after that, you know, you better be prepared to make it right because if they go if they go into court and they say, I told them to fix it, I paid them $2,200, it's not fixed, and they won't do anything about it, that's when the judge will clean your plow. Now, if they come and say, I don't want all of the work done, just half the work done, then it's on them. <laughs> See, if they wouldn't let you do it all, get me? That's how that works. I've been there, guys, and seen, seen them things happen, all right? All right, let me see here. Um, let me see, I'm going into a, I lost my place again. I, I can't believe it. Which type digital multimeter can measure current when clamped around a conductor? Inductive. It's an inductive meter. That's the one like we use, sort of like on our uh, big uh, charging system. You have that curly cord with that thing on there. Uh, the ability to measure AC current is useful when diagnosing what? Alternator functions. Yeah, because the alternator is basically putting out AC current, but it's going through a rectifier bridge on the way. Uh, you're not going to use AC current doing much of anything else. Um, the internal resistance of any meter is effective only if the meter is set on what scale? One meter. What do you think, guys? That's Charlie, isn't it? The internal resistance of any meter is effective only if the meter is set on uh, volt scale, actually, believe it or not. Now, when you're doing an ohmmeter reading and it's a really low thing, you need to touch your meter leads together, see what they read, subtract that from your reading to get the one that you that you're wanting, you know. Uh, but the voltmeter, when they're they're talking about impedance here, Lundy is what they're talking about basically. You know, like we talked earlier, when measuring resistance, the reading of OL on the di digital multimeter is what? Yeah, basically, yeah, it's an open circuit as far as that range is concerned. When interpreting meter readings in auto ranging mode. What are you supposed to do there? B. Both A and B. Note the prefix indicated by the meter is what I was talking about earlier. Convert the reading prefix to base units if needed. Uh, digital meters for automotive testing should include what? Did DC amps up to at least 10 amps? A diode tester, both A and B. That's going to be it. You're going to be looking at a C there. Um, and if you can't, if I've got a meter, this is red meters that they gave me for free. And I got five red meters, and you know the bigger looking red meters I got out there, they will not measure amperage in excess of a quarter of an amp. And I'm thinking that's probably why they gave them to all these schools. They gave me five. They gave every school five, and they're okay for volts. But look at the, the look where the uh, ohms ranges are on the double thing. It starts at 2,000 and goes up to 200,000. What good is that? You know what I mean? The, the, it's, it's too high, and it won't measure amps. I mean, that's why those things, I'm usually telling you, don't bring me one of those red meters, bring me one of these other ones, you know. That's why I'm telling you that. I mean, but I think they got them, they, they messed up when they built them, they couldn't sell them, and so they just started giving them away. Just, we'll just give five of them to the schools and write them off, you know. I mean, they're pretty solid the way they're built and all that kind of stuff, but the settings on them are junk. You know, you can't really... Uh, do anything with them. I had one instructor that was here that said uh, when I showed him one of those meters, he goes, "Yeah, I gave those away for door prizes a long time ago." <laughs> you know, but anyway, um, um, let me see. Let me see. We're almost through here. Um, let me see. Uh, which of the fo which with which signal pattern is the RMS reading the same as the average reading? That's a good question, isn't it? That's a sine wave. What's RMS mean? What's the word? What's the root what's means square. Very good, Lundy. Woo! I can always count on Lundy. Usually. All right. Hey there, right, Lundy. All right. Which term is used to describe the resolution of a meter? What the Sam Hill are we talking about? Resolution. Um, what if I've got if I've got a high resolution photo? That means that I can zoom in on it and see your eyelashes. If I've got a low resolution photo, I might zoom in on your eyeball, but I almost sees a fuzzy blob. Got me. Now, a meter basically 
is going to measure so many times per second. Now the cool thing about a digital storage oscilloscope is it measures, you know, zillions of times per second. I mean a lot, depending on the scope, you know, 20, 50,000 million times a second, whatever. And so if you've got something that will measure it, the biggest problem with having a meter that won't measure it but about three or four times a second is if you've got a real quick dropout, your meter may not end. Which one we own? Which term is used to describe the resolution of a meter? Both A and B. Resolution of a meter is important because you want it to catch stuff that happens suddenly. When selecting a meter, accuracy readings that are blank indicate more precise meters. That's actually lower, yeah. When working on a hybrid vehicle, what type of meter is recommended? Cat 3 or Cat 4? Cat 3 or a, well, actually, yeah. I do not like uh, anything but less than a Cat 3 on a meter. And there's actually, if you go online, you can find a video where Fluke shows a Cat 1 or a Cat 2 meter being hooked up to some really high voltage. And you know what happens? The meter explodes like a bomb. <laughs> Boom! There's no piece of it around that you can find, you know. And you really don't want that. I've got some really, I got some Cat 3 meters here that we use when we're fooling with hybrid stuff. Okay, the DMM is set to read ohms. What does this reading mean when it's set to read ohms? Huh? What does that mean? That means it's an open circuit. On this meter, uh, the reading converts to how many ohms is this meter reading? Three plus one Huh? What's she say? Three thousand one hundred twenty four. Yeah. That's actually the dog D, yeah. Okay. There you are, guys. That was a good old test.